All right, so we're going to continue the focus of this morning's session on sustainability with a, a, a focused discussion today on uh, what is a very you know large initiative moving through consultation right now, the Sustainable Agriculture Strategy. Uh, I am the, going to moderate again, uh, and in doing so, I am also the co-chair of the advisory committee that informs the Sustainable Ag Strategy's development. And so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I think it's a really great kind of flow to this morning's discussion, touching on so many different facets of sustainability, because at the end of the day, um, when we're talking about sustainable ag strategy, I think there's a, a, a misnomer that it's entirely exclusively focused on environmental sustainability. And I think if you, you know, read through the documentation, um, take part in the engagement sessions that are happening, there is a real focus on what we were just talking about in the last panel before us, this sense of how do you create a truly sustainable platform uh, for making progress on environmental sustainability while acknowledging that you know profitability, competitiveness, social sustainability all need to be dealt with in lockstep and that we can't deal with these issues in isolation. It is an overarching integrated strategy to really help guide how we can support producers moving forwards to achieving their sustainability objectives. And uh, this really consultation launched at the end of uh, 2022 in December and is open till March 31st. So just for all of you in the room, I encourage you to engage uh, in written submission and in the uh, stakeholder engagement sessions that are ongoing across the country over the coming months here to make sure you have a voice in this because I think you'll hear time and again, the intention behind this is that it is a farmer informed strategy for farmers. And I think that is absolutely central, but it, it's incumbent on you as leaders to really engage in this conversation and make sure for, the farm voice is heard loud and clear in the process. So I'll kickstart things off with an introduction of my co-chair in the advisory committee, Sophie Beecher, who's the Director General and the Strategic Policy Branch's Sustainable Development Policy Directive. She'll provide an overview of the sustainable agriculture strategy and then uh, joined by her colleague, Dr. Joyce Boy from the Science and Tech Branch to speak a little bit about Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's analytical work that really does provide that foundation to really support a lot of the discussions that have to take place as part of this conversation. Um, following their presentations, we'll hear from Sarah Delisle, uh, Agriclimat Agri Coordinator from the Council for the Development of Agriculture, and she'll share insights from her work examining the current and future carbon footprints of various farming models in Quebec to give some context, I think, to uh, something we hear time and again at the advisory committee, data. Data is absolutely critical to every facet of this conversation and it really spans, you know, informing the baselines of where we are today, what the targets we're looking to in 2030 and 2050 mean, and really ensuring we have practical pragmatic uh, pathways to get from where we are today to those uh, places. So without any further ado, I'll invite Sophie up to the mic to speak uh, today and thank you all again for being here as part of this conversation. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here today. I think this is uh, an essential group to be speaking uh, to about the, uh, the sustainable ag strategy. Um, a lot of you will be very familiar with what I'm about to talk about. A lot of you have already been consulted, you've participated in our workshops, some of you are members of our advisory committee, but I think this is a great opportunity to explain the vision behind what we're trying to achieve here, um, all of the facets we're trying to bring together, the various challenges and the opportunities that we're faced with. So I will also be speaking in both French and English, so warning up front. Um, so, slide two. Donc, le but aujourd'hui, c'est de vous donner... The goal today is to give you an overview of the process that we aim at following. We are at this point in the midst of our consultations. This is of a national scope. This is more of a fact-finding stage, if I may say so. And we would move on to solutions, uh, tangible actions, opportunities. The process is to um, underscore all the options, uh, all the factors that are to be taken uh, into account in uh, setting up our strategy. All that would be uh, stated in a document how we can continue engaging you. So this is a sustainable engagement uh, 
endeavor and uh, the image of uh, the outcome product that would uh, reflect uh, what we're aiming at. I SAS. Um, so you're all very familiar with the reasons for this. Um, producers uh, have been living through, I think, the, the impacts of uh, climate change and environmental factors in recent years. Um, you've all been um, uh, great stewards of the land and working on your environmental performance in the past 20 years, but uh, you're still very much vulnerable to, to climate change. And we can see this uh, due to um, bouts of heat waves, intense precipitation, floods, droughts. Uh, this year's been particularly illustri illustrative of that, um, with huge impacts on agricultural production and, of course, food security. And so we really do want to take uh, into account in developing the SAS the economic well-being of producers and of rural communities. We heard all about that this morning during the, the labor presentation. Therefore, there is really a need to work together, uh, set a clear path forward at the federal level, but involving provinces and territories, and of course, all of you and stakeholders around the country, um, to maximize the, the, the positive outcomes and further support the, the sector uh, on climate change and environmental priorities. And we have two, um, two, year, two sort of years, key years in mind, 2030, uh, for the immediate targets and objectives set, but uh, much further uh, uh, up to 2050. So we hope the SAS will guide our actions up until uh, 2050. Uh, it's important to say that, of course, um, any strategy we come up with this year uh, will not be static. Uh, it cannot, you know, one strategy cannot carry us as is to 2050. It will be an iterative process. We anticipate ongoing um, uh, consultations and, and modifications to the SAS over the years. So on December 12th, uh, 2022, Minister Bibo launched the, the consultations um, to inform the development of the SAS. Many of you were there, uh, so uh, thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, talked extensively about the importance of coordinated, a coordinated federal approach uh, with uh, a social sustainability lens and an economic sustainability lens as well. So bringing all three pillars together. Next slide. Alors ici on parle des, des facteurs de so here we're talking about uh, determining factors as well as challenges. We spoke uh, about that in the previous slide, but but uh, to underscore that we know that uh, the agricultural sector has to uh, keep pace with the market uh, and uh, you have shown flexibility and adaptability and you keep on seeking new opportunities while taking into account commercial restrictions. And uh, this is the ba basis of our work. This is the reality you face on a daily basis. You have also brought uh, uh, better improvement uh, to um, the uh, health of your soil, and we have more to do. Uh, data show us that uh, we have not achieved our environmental achievement. We still have some work to do. You are still leaving uh, climate change incidences, and we know that there is an impact on your livestock as well as uh, the products that uh, you end up having, and there is a problem with uh, diseases and uh, with pests, and, um, and there is an issue also on um, supply chain consequently. Also, we have our consumers that worry about environmental issues, about uh, uh, prices, and they require more actions and more proof that our sector is working in this field. We have to also look at sustainability with regards to national market and external mar market. And finally, 
we have some shortcomings with regards to data and performance measurement. And so we have to look at those aspects as well. Um, so this is, uh, this is one of my favorite slides because it actually uh, traces a, a portrait of what we are working with. Um, so you know, uh, emissions as a result of agriculture in, in, uh, in Canada on the left-hand side, and a bit of an explanation of the, the very complex uh, system um, represented by the ag sector in relation to the environment. This is actually a slide that we like to show our other federal departments when we discuss things with them to make them understand the unique challenges to this, uh, to this sector. Um, <clears throat> so, <laughs> the, one of the main challenges, of course, is that a lot of emissions in ag uh, are the process of biological processes. And it's not as simple as, for instance, um, very specific actions such as in the, in the oil and gas industry where they have maybe a little bit more control. Uh, here we are really dealing with things that just naturally occur as a result of uh, raising livestock and growing crops. Um, we also need, I've mentioned this a couple times already, uh, all the while that we're trying to reach national targets on climate change and environment, we have to ensure productivity and competitiveness. So that's the, um, that's the, the space where possible trade-offs will be necessary. From a policy and program perspective, it is really important to keep in mind that uh, quite an important proportion of emissions are actually exempt from the carbon pollution pricing system. And therefore, if we are to make further progress um, on these environmental and climate change issues, we must rely on the voluntary actions of producers. So this is very much about how do we further change our behaviors? How do we further implement um, new ways of doing things that will have staying power. And in recent consultations, we've heard a lot from producers on the, the no-till, the success of no-till in Canada, and how that took 20 years, essentially, to, to implement. And that, that's the kind of, that's the size of the challenge that we're facing. Um, and so therefore, we're really looking for different ways to incentivize um, uh, producers to adopt new, new ways of doing things, new methods, um, and all ideas are welcome. Slide six. So here on this slide, we're talking about uh, consumers and their opinion and the actions that they want us uh, to uh, adapt. And we see that consumers uh, have the uh, possibility to boycott uh, a food product. And they are interested in uh, the usage of plastic. Uh, and uh, there is a whole debate on uh, meat consumption uh, uh, with the question whether less should be consumed. And uh, you also have, of course, uh, the nutritional aspect. Uh, the position of consumers might change throughout the time, but there are issues that perception is aligned with facts. Really, uh, back to producers, they are on the front lines of this ch the, the changes that we want to bring. They understand the importance of managing um, the, their ecosystem. Um, most producers that we speak to are very well versed in nutrient uh, and water cycling, carbon sequestration, pollination. They realize that stewardship uh, is essential um, to, to preserve their own, their own resources, water, soil, uh, biodiversity, and to ensure the long-term success of their own farms. And so the, the will is there, and the question is, how do we all align our, our, our ideas, resources, vision uh, to get there together? Slide eight. Donc, uh, la stratégie. So the a sustainable agriculture strategy aims at having a coordination approach. First of all, within the uh, federal government itself, we understand that we are not the best at coordinating ourselves, even within the uh, Department of Agriculture, with our colleagues in our different programs, our colleagues uh, in the science field, that we try to find an alignment for ourselves. and. Uh, 
we want the vision uh, to uh, be at uh, the scope of our country and that all territories uh, be part of our action. We learn from our mistakes uh, in the past and uh, and we recognize the um, efforts of the industry of producers. And we want to have under the same tent all the necessary measures to have a real um, harmonization. The government is also working on all other strategies, the national adaptation strategy. We have the methane strategy that was published last year. Um, we have a newly announced Canada Water Agency. These are all efforts that are ongoing um, under the leadership of other departments, notably Environment uh, Canada. And we think that there's a real need for, first of all, um, ag to have its interests well represented in the face of these strategies, but also that all of these strategies need to work together. And so the SAS is meant to to harmonize the, the federal government's approach on all of these topics and make it coherent for the, uh, for the ag sector. Next uh, slide. Uh, so I've already spoken about um, what we're building on. So uh, we've already got uh, uh, strong programs and Marco elaborated on that this morning. Um, you know, the government's already invested in technology. Uh, we have a strong science and research department. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the, the conversation needs to build on all of this. Um, so, uh, you know, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Dr. Boy in a minute on uh, the science and, and, and research component of AFC and how it all fits into this. But uh, yeah, this is uh, truly about aligning ourselves first and foremost. Next slide. These are the phases of the development of the strategy. So I've spoken a little bit about that. Um, we have a, a document, uh, a reference document on our website right now as part of phase one um, to sort of prepare, to prepare everybody for the discussion. So we're sort of past that phase. We're, we're really sort of like more in the consultation mode right now. Um, we are consulting uh, extensively through a series of workshops. So we have thematic workshops. We also have regional workshops. Um, to, to sort of ponder specific questions and really get to the root of what we need to, to address, set ourselves some outcomes and objectives, and identify the actions and strategies necessary. Phase three is all about solutions, and then phase four eventually will be about implementation. Um, it is really important for me to tell you that the government did not start this exercise off with a strategy in hand. It is really uh, going to be building the strategy uh, following these consultations and the, the feedback that we're getting. Um, and so, you know, there's a truly sort of um, intellectually honest enterprise here, if I can put it that way. Next slide. <laughs> Is this a dramatic effect? Okay. <laughs> Uh, so this is the, the very ambitious timeline that we've set out for ourselves. We're in the middle of consultations, as I've, I've mentioned. Um, we will continue developing sort of the policy work behind the strategy over the spring and summer. We are aiming to have a draft strategy by the end of this year. I know it is terribly ambitious, but that's what we've set out for ourselves. Uh, we've also um, created, in partnership with the, the CFA, an advisory committee, so very happy to be up here with my co-chair. Um, here are the current members of the advisory committee. Uh, this committee is meant to supplement um, the, the broader consultation effort, but then afterwards, this committee will serve as the representatives of the sector to continue the, the engagement on the strategy. And we really hope to have an ongoing conversation um, between ourselves and, and the committee about the development of the policy and use them almost as a, a feed, an immediate feedback loop to our work. So once we sort of um, elaborate parts of the, the strategy or have some options or some ideas, we, we want to sit down with the advisory committee on a regular basis, like a couple times a month, um, put it in front of them and, and get their immediate feedback. And of course, every member of the advisory committee is very encouraged to be speaking to their own members, their own communities, uh, anybody else who wants to weigh in, um, it is really meant to be a, an open and transparent exercise. 
Next slide. Uh, these are some of our sessions uh, that are planned. Um, so I've mentioned the workshops. Uh, we have completed the regional workshop that included British Columbia, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. It was particularly well attended. And we got some, some very candid feedback, which we really appreciate. Uh, we're looking forward to the other regional workshops as well, and there will be one in French at the end that covers Canada uh, nationally. We have a series of roundtables that are planned. I know that our minister will be engaging personally in some of, uh, in some of the, the roundtables. And so we also encourage you to give us any further suggestions on the engagement that we should be conducting or any opportunities you would like us to participate in. We're always open to that. Next slide. Um, so here we just essentially provide you with some links um, to our document and our survey. Uh, and our resources. Um, I would like to tell you that our portal is open until the end of March for written submissions. We are willing to accept submissions from anyone, so associations, producers, scientists, um, individuals who have opinions. Uh, please send them all in. Um, of course, so Sandra might not be happy, but anyways, I'll say it anyways, Sandra. You know, even when the portal closes, please just send us your feedback. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just keep taking it in. Um, so is that my last slide? Yes. So thank you for, for your time this morning. We look forward to some of your uh, feedback, uh, you know, when we open up the mics. But for now, I will turn to my colleague, Dr. Boyd. Thanks, uh, Sophie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Delighted to be here today and to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about how science and innov innovation can contribute tools and solutions to the sustainable agriculture strategy. My remarks will be brief as we want to make sure we have enough time for Q&A um, at the end of this session. And so I'll move on to the next slide. As uh, many of you know, um, AFC is the single largest science provider um, in Canada. Uh, we are dispersed right across the country with over 20 research and development centers, including 30 satellite locations from coast to coast, uh, with just over 2,300 staff contributing research um, and development to support the sector. And together with our collaborators and, and partners, and this includes academia, producer associations, uh, the food processing sector, our research covers the entire spectrum from upstream research, foundational research, all the way to downstream applied research. And over the years, the results from our research activities have helped in many different ways. Uh, some examples are provided on the slide here building resilient, resilience in the um, fight against climate change, which is much of uh, the focus of the discussion so today, uh, providing safe and sustainable crop protection and best management practices to enable knowledge um, translation, um, adoption, hopefully. Uh, we're also looking at keeping our water safe and clean by minimizing effluents and sharing access to healthy food through our work on food attributes and nutrition, which many of you will be familiar with. Increasingly looking at reducing food waste uh, by promoting greater circularity in food systems, and you'll be hearing more and more about that, um, as well as providing food security in northern and indigenous communities. And this also is increasingly a focus for the work that we are doing within uh, the department. Next slide. So the next slide uh, provides some of the examples of uh, the scientific breakthroughs emanating from the research activities that um, we have been undertaking. And some of you are very familiar with these. I'll just highlight a, a few. It includes our, our role as a world leader um, in the discovery and development of uh, disease-resistant canola germplasm, as well as um, a variety of uh, new crops that we have developed, wheat, barley, oats, uh, and, uh, soy, um, advanced potato selections, to, to name a few. Our researchers have also been critical um, in developing technologies that contributed to the high rate of zero to late adoption, and so if you referred to this, and this has allowed farmers to increase uh, cropping intensity, diversity, and yields 
while reducing the requirements for fuel and, and labor. And this has profoundly transformed agriculture, uh, certainly in Western Canada over the past uh, few decades. Our research has also resulted in the development of mitch tolerant uh, weed varieties, and we continue to conduct world-class research to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as part of our research in, in, in the livestock sector. Greenhouse gas mitigation has been a priority for the department, and this has enabled, enabled the development of advanced uh, science expertise. And some of the other uh, successes we have is in the area of pest management practices um, to help reduce uh, the pest pressures, the biotic pressures that we face, as well as value-added food processes and, and food products. And this covers the, the spectrum of the work uh, that we do. Recently, we have developed the uh, AFC Strategic Plan for Science that I hope many of you are uh, familiar with. Uh, now we have shared that extensively. And this will guide uh, the delivery of science for the next 10 years or so. It is an evergreen document, and we will continue to refine it to respond to the needs and pressures uh, that the sector um, is facing. AFC recognizes that the challenges facing the sector have changed tremendously over the last uh, several years, and with it, the complexity in solving them. And this is reflected in the mandate letters of the ministers um, and the ambitious challenge that we have uh, for Canada. And as a result, the strategic plan is forward-looking and it seeks to tackle uh, the root causes of the key issues uh, that the, the sector is, is facing. The goal of the Strat Plan is to support producers. It's, it's a roadmap, effectively, towards a more resilient farming system that is not only productive, but that can stand up to the challenges ahead. It builds on the foundation of our previous sector strategies, and so for those of you who are familiar with the sector strategies that we had before, we had nine sector strategies, um, and they were aligned with four branch objectives of productivity, environment, attributes, and threats. This new science plan is gonna build and expand on the previous sector strategy uh, that, that we have, and there are three main elements. So the next slide provides um, an overview of this uh, new um, strategic plan for science. The three elements there, the first one is mission-driven science, and it's a paradigm shift towards sustainable agriculture, leveraging the innovation ecosystem and building science capacity to grow the knowledge economy. The second pillar uh, focuses on people and talent, and it's focused on building the workforce that will support the delivery of this ambitious um, strategic plan. And the third is organizational excellence, and this includes maximizing impact through knowledge mobilization. The earlier panel um, made reference to that, the need to transfer knowledge and technology to the sector to support adoption and implementation. It also focuses on reconciliation and ensuring higher standards and science integrity as we deliver on the science. So alongside these three key elements, uh, we have the four science missions. That's really at the heart of the strategic plan. And these four missions will provide the direction for the science we do. They're aligned with the government and departmental priorities with a sustainable agriculture paradigm. So the first mission, and I hope you can read this clearly on the screen, is mitigating and adapting to climate change. And the expected outcomes for this first mission includes competitive net zero or low emission production systems, enabling carbon capture, climate adaptation solutions, including sustainable food production for Canada's remote and northern communities. The second mission is increasing the resiliency of agroecosystems. And this includes supporting alternative pest management approaches that reduce the need for chemical pesticides and equipping the sector with more proactive approaches to risk management. And the objective here is really to move towards a One Health approach uh, that considers you know, resources, including soil and water, biodiversity, within plant, animal, and human health. 
And the third mission is advancing the circular economy of developing, by developing value-added opportunities. And so, encouraging ways to eliminate, uh, reduce, and repurpose food waste to add value to these uh, byproduct streams um, on farm as well as post farm gate. And the fourth is really the digital, uh, has a digital focus. It's accelerating the digital transformation. And this includes supporting the integration of crop and livestock production, um, pasture management, and climate resilient cultivar development using a combination of omic tools. Uh, to support this digital transformation of the sector. Um, and the hope is to have the competitiveness that we are looking for in the short, medium, as well as in the long term. The mission-driven science approach is designed to be broad and flexible, uh, to allow our research teams to orient their current work towards these missions. We will continue to work with a multitude of our partners right across the country um, and globally to ensure that the foods and other agricultural foods we produce and export remain safe, high quality, and environmentally sustainable. The Strat, the, the Strat Plan is a vision really for how research and development will tackle um, activities that will enable a resilient and sustainable agriculture sector that is also competitive, profitable, um, and productive. And so with this, I am going to hand this over to the next uh, panelist, and I look forward very much to participating in the Q&A session. Thank you. Should I do this? Um, Good morning, everyone. So for those who want to listen, you can use the headset. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today. So let's take a look at a Quebec farm. We'll tell you what's the carbon footprint on a farm. Some people have mentioned this before, but I'll be sharing some results that stem from Quebec. So to start this off, you have English slides on the English, the English slides on the left, French slides on the French. So what is agriclimate? It's a project initiated by Quebec farmers with the goal of fighting climate change efficiently. So we want to tackle climate change by giving tools to producers. The first step is to develop a diagnosis method that is adapted to the farming reality. So I'll be talking about this tool, it's the carbon footprint, but there's also another aspect that we've mentioned before is adaptation to climate change. But today I'll be just be tackling this, this specific tool. The second objective, since it's uh, something that people have been talking a lot, the goal is to bring together competencies, competencies in Quebec. So, as mentioned, we've been working with different partners, but the major partner is the Réseau des Fermes Pilotes. I think there's a lag between the English and the French slides. Not sure how we can fix this. Do I go back or? Not sure why, what's happening, you can look on that side. Not sure what we can do to fix this. Maybe the technicians could fix this. Maybe we can go back to the previous slide. They're showing the results. Do not look at the results. Don't, don't look to the left. So, okay, we're on the right page, good. We'll try to coordinate this together. So here are the results I'm presenting today. These results are made thanks to 38 pilot farms that have been working with us since 2021, so we can study together how could a carbon footprint look at. But we also we want to target different farms. Today I'll be sharing one specific project 
pilot, but of course we cover beef production, sheep production, pork pr production, poultry production, vegetable pr producers. So UPA brings together different uh, regional federations. Uhanos is a conglomerate. In Quebec, as you probably know, there's also a broad network of advisors that work together through Via Paul d'Expertise. So, moving forward, what is a carbon footprint? Just to make sure we're on the same wavelength, because we're also talking about uh, different carbon footprint within different branches. When a producer receives its carbon footprint, first we look at the emissions on the farm. All activities are farming activities, including the use of inputs. So carbon footprint of inputs that go on the farm. The long-term effects, volatility of fertilizer, that's part of GHH emissions on the farm. Then we look at, is it possible to sequester carbon through soil or for windbreakers that are put along the farms? So there's a plus or a minus to combine these two or subtract these two. In some cases we can sequester, sometimes we can emit carbon through soil. All that gives you the carbon footprint. It could be positive, negative, or neutral. That's interesting to see if it's plus, minus, or neutral. So here are the farm we'll be looking at. So we'll be focusing on big production. Here we're using, as an example, a medium-sized farm. It's a hypothetical farm that was built by using different data coming from the name coming from uh, Quebec. So this farm has 952 square feet that produces soja, soya, wheat. It also inputs fertilizer. So here you have the portion, the simplified portion. You see the biggest uh, emissions for that farm. 61% comes from the soil, from the use, use of fertilizer, so it's specific fertilizer. 24% comes from energy production. We also use a lot of machinery, uh, machinery to dry crops, so that's why 24%. And lastly, we have the carbon footprint of fabrication of fertilizer. So that's on the hectare basis, but this is, could also be used using kilograms of proteins. We've been using the most useful unity to understand carbon footprint on the farm. Then we ask the question, once we have our carbon footprint, once we, has, we have our carbon footprint, we try to see if it's possible to reduce carbon emissions. So here are three scenarios we'll be looking at. This is a, something we've been using by sci through science. The goal is not to have just one action and another action or to add them up. We've chosen some actions and we're trying to see the effect of that action on the farm to reduce carbon emissions. Maybe we can modify some parameters, maybe we can add some inputs or remove some, in some inputs. So three different scenarios. The first scenario is the scenario that's accessible to producers. This is nothing new. This is something well known to producers. We just have to put them in place to see how we can in in put them in place on the farm. The second scenario, we're using Accept, acceptable information, known information on farm, but in some instances it's preferable to have more advice, more support, or maybe there's an additional cost to the producer. The third scenario, there's more need for financial support and some scientific knowledge is not yet uh, achievable. Biochar is one example. There's some interesting data that is being produced, but for example the dosage, the, the, 
the cost. There's a lot of unknowns in scenario number three. That's why it's in the third column. So, so there's a difference between these three scenarios. And these scenarios offer different efficiencies when reducing carbon emissions. So there's lots of advisors, different scientists that look at different scenarios to see if it's achievable on the farm. So we'll, at the farm, we'll try to achieve these di different scenarios. So the refer reference scenario is the base scenario. So we take a hypothetical farm we're at 2.62 ton of CO2 by hectare. So that's our reference scenario. After that, we'll see what happens for scenario one, two, and three. So they're all on the same slide. We don't have time to go into details, but we can see in the column to the right how we can progress in reducing car our carbon footprint. Remember scenario one and two take into account accessible techniques. The third scenario, there are more unknowns. In scenario three, we're very optimistic. We're expecting science to progress so we can apply these solutions. So this, this was done in the dairy sector, uh, in the beef sector. The goal here is to reduce carbon footprint in different sectors by using these scenarios. In this farm, it's a bit uh, simple. When you look at the dairy farm, it's a system that's way more complex, but we still manage to make some progress when reducing carbon footprint by working to reduce methane emissions. Once we've done that, we've talked about carbon. When We've also looked at uh, emissions and scenarios to reduce carbon footprint. Without, before showing you the results, I think we should look at a map of Canada. We can see that there are significant differences between East and West. So in Quebec, our reality is quite different from yours for multiple reasons. The first reason is the age of uh, land. We've been, we've been using or we've been doing agriculture um, differently than in, uh, in, the, in the west of the country. So the soil is different because of the way we use soil in uh, different parts of the country. So that's why there's a difference between east and west. So it's a reality from one, uh, from one side to the other side of the country. So a quick reminder, this image comes from a Quebec scientist. It, shows you what uh, I've been talking about. So there's a balance initially, there's a forest, there's a lot of uh, um, organic material, we have a lot of trees. When we started agriculture, we disturb the forest, we change the soil, the nature of the soil. Oftentimes, when we want to have uh, long-term plants production, this has an impact on the soil. And because of that, that creates emissions, carbon emissions. After that, we have annual plants. And so we continue to degrade the soil in a significant way. And so it's a process that's well known, that's quite natural. Once we move something, it emits carbon emissions. After we reach a balance, it's probably what happened in uh, land we've been using for quite some time. So we reached a balance, and after that, to adopt better practices to reduce carbon emissions and rebuild soil with organic matter. That's when we do carbon sequestration. But of course, we won't be able to go back to the initial stage where forests were plenty. And now we reached a new balance, which is lower than the balance we had a long time ago. So here are the results of our farms. We had 30, 28 pilot farms. We kept 28 of these farms of the 30, 38. The other farms didn't have enough data or some data were wrong. So we kept 28 farms out of the 38 farms. 
So we, we've been studying these farms. 13 farms are losing carbon, 6 farms are more or less stable, and 8 farms are seeing an increase in carbon stock. So, as a quick reminder, these farms uh, produce um, uh, it's cow production, they emit uh, methane. So these are the results of our pilot farms. It's consistent with the map I've shown you. We have loss of uh, carbon in Quebec. Given the, histor the, his the history of the soil, of the climate in Quebec, you see the results coming from these farms. Once that's said, we can look at the overall carbon footprint results. On screen you have the emissions from the farm, emissions of the three th scenarios. So these three scenarios, I'll, another, I'll add another layer, which is the cover and windbreakers. So we can see the end results of these pilot farms. So that would be an ideal uh, achievable scenario for us. This is the reference scenario. At the very beginning, we had uh, 2.61 2, initially. Then we added carbon emissions or sequestration because there was a lot. There was a loss of uh, organic material, and then we have a carbon footprint total of 3.98 CO2 tons per hectare. So you can see the overall carbon footprint results as a reference. Now, if we change the practices, we've seen scenario one, we managed to reduce emissions, and now we add uh, coverage crops. We haven't yet uh, added some trees. Now we have a reduction of 25% of the total results on the farm. Scenario two, it's also achievable, but with a financial support from uh, advisors but we can manage to reach 2.68 tons of CO2 for a reduction of 33% compared to the reference scenario. And the third scenario, which is not achievable, but might be achievable within 10-15 years, we want to reduce by 51% the carbon footprint. But that uh, those results are based on a hypothetical farm. We've compiled the data, and then that's a big difference. That's why it's important to do it on every farm, because every farm has different skills, different tools, different equipment, and some farms might, might manage to reduce the carbon footprint more than others. So all that to say, this is the biggest trend. It's not just one farm. We've identified some farms, but um, it just gives you an overview of what's achievable. So, to end, so farms, generally speaking, emit emissions. Of course, uh, a cranberry farm doesn't have the same footprint as a cattle farm, but more or less all farms emit emissions because every farm produces some type of activity. It's also possible to reduce the carbon footprint using different tools by focusing on knowledges, but also understanding the cost of changing practices or doing more in innovations to reduce emissions. Also to train advisors that can support producers in, in and having those changes on the farm, that's very very important. And also collaboration between farmers, agronomists, and researchers. That's the key to be able to reduce uh, the carbon footprint. So that's it. Thank you very much. And a quick reminder. We also have some fun from the Department of Agriculture of Quebec. We also receive funding from other partners. We work with 100 different farms to understand their carbon footprint. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you to all of our panelists today. I think this was a really good sort of flow uh, to inform the discussion we're going to have in front of us now. So, uh, as I said at the outset, you know, we at CFA are very pleased to partner uh, in co chairing the advisory committee to inform the sustainable ag strategy. Um, but really, it is incumbent upon us as a sector to engage and provide information. So really now is a great time for anyone in the audience. If you have questions for the panelists, please come up to a mic. If you have feedback with respect to, I think, a few different areas I'd just highlight. One, I think one of the things we just heard about is the practicalities involved in achieving some of the outcomes that may be identified under the Sustain Ag strategy around whether it's carbon sequestration, net zero agriculture, other emissions reduction targets. Uh, also the importance of data, and I think that's a, a theme that comes up time and again at the advisory committee and in many of the other engagement sessions as well, is what do we know, what don't we know, and where do we need to you know, advance science and advance collection of data to better inform gaps that may exist. And then the last being, and, and I think this is a great opportunity to hear from you as, as farmers on the ground across the country, what do you see as the priority areas for your regions, for your farm that can really make an impactful difference, and, and what are the opportunities and constraints that inform that. So I don't want to take any more time up front here on the mic. Are there any questions or comments from the floor? Linda. And just please introduce yourself and your organization when you speak as well. Hi, my name is Linda Nicola. I'm the Executive Director of Manitoba Association of Watersheds. I want to thank you all for your presentations. It was very informative. Um, Sophie, I was wondering specifically if you could expand a bit on the integration of the Sustainable Agricultural Strategy and the Canadian Water Strategy and how you see those working together. I feel like that was probably a pretty transparent question coming from a Watersheds gal, but, um, and also specifically in Manitoba anyway, and I, I believe in other provinces as well, there has been or is ongoing the development of provincial water strategies. And I'm curious how you see all of those um, various strategies integrating together so that it's um, efficient for end users such as agricultural producers. Yes, thank you. As soon as you said who you were, I knew where this was going, so. <laughs> Very predictable. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the creation of the Canada Water Agency has been a long time in the making. Um, I think this was a, uh, an ambition that was uh, expressed a few years ago, and then I think we finally come to um, a little bit more sort of, uh, of an understanding of what's about to occur. It will be uh, led by ECCC, I believe. The, the water agency will continue to report to the Minister of the Environment. And so that minister will be responsible for the integration of all, all things water. Um, AFC uh, has been working really closely with ECCC because we have a few concerns. <laughs> I think it's, it's a, the C word, I don't know, I don't like it. But anyways, uh, nevertheless, we have a few concerns. We, we don't want the conversation around water to sort of run away from the departments and the sectors that are the most impacted. And so um, the biggest importance for us is to keep, um, keep the voice of AFC integrated into the agency itself, uh, work in close partnership and bring forth the perspective of this sector to everything they undertake. Um, so that we don't, we don't sort of end up with a bit of a theoretical integration of issues and um, no practical application, um, you know, the, the reality not being taken into account. As to the coordination with provinces, I think that will be really up to them to ensure that that occurs. Um, my understanding of the water agency, because it is a federal agency, they have to concentrate on watersheds that go, that cross provincial boundaries. So they will really be focusing, I, I think on 10 major watersheds across Canada. But of course, the components of these watersheds are very much inside provinces. Um, and uh, provinces also have specific considerations in respect to their water. Um, so we're all gonna have to work together. And I think it is really important as this water agency is being constituted that not only our department continues to be at the table and actively involved, but that all of you maybe start thinking about how you wanna make representations to that agency. And as usual, we're, we're here to support you in that. Thank you, Sophie. I've got a question at the front, and I think, uh, oh, were you there first, I believe? So if you'd like to go first, just introduce yourself and your organization. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Uh, my name is Phil Paxton, and um, I'm from Alberta, but I'm with an organization called the Canadian Ornamental Horticultural Alliance. So we're in the sector of horticulture. 
And what was interesting in the graphics you showed is how many times um, trees and our products, or ornamental products, are included. But the amount of research that is put aside for that component seems to be many times a struggle to get uh, different departments to look at. So it's interesting how the, the arrows were kind of going up all the time and then you see a couple of graphics where the arrows go down and some of our products. So it seems like I'm maybe pushing our products, but I'm a farmer and we have a terrible time getting that message across. Um, and then it, it said, you know, riparian zones and, um, and, and, co and um, shelter belts, but marginal land as well is a, a really important piece in that. And uh, the difficulty is connecting the dots sometimes, and I just wondered if I could get a, a bit of a comment on that piece, uh, just to, to help me understand why that piece is uh, at times quite difficult to, to get the message across. Would anyone like? I, I can start us off. Um, so, about trees, I do believe that our science branch um, is uh, very much positive in the finding that the addition of trees to ag land is one of the most effective uh, BMPs um, out there, and we recognize that. So I think ag would very much say that the addition of trees is probably in our top three star practices for, for producers. The question then is, what do we need to uh, incentivize or convince um, or facilitate the inclusion of that particular um, of that particular practice. Um, you know, it's. Um, I mean, that's something that we're addressing through the SCAP currently with uh, the RALP program that's in the making, specifically about uh, the planting of trees and you know their possible role. Um, but are, are there other avenues that we should be exploring to to encourage that? Um, what is what is missing beyond financial incentives to get producers to look into so, some of those very simple solutions, very effective solutions? Um, and then, of course, uh, can you know? There's always the question of um, the federal government and its multiple departments and where everybody fits in. So we do know that our uh, our natural resources department has a lot of uh, forestry programming, so how can ag work with, with that department to make it all coherent in the end? So those, those are some of my sort of basic thoughts on that topic. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything. Sure, I could, I could add. Um, so we are doing research, and, and we have done extensive research on, on this um, and continue to do that. Um, the Living Labs uh, program is also uh, providing an opportunity to go out there and put some of these practices in place and, and get data um, out there on the farm, not just at our research facilities. And it would be great to hear from you how we can move more and more towards uh, adoption and uptake of the knowledge that comes out of the research activities that are, are going on. And so if you have any feedback on that, it would be great to, to hear from you, because ultimately with the knowledge that we have, it's important to make sure that, that is effectively translated and adopted by the sector. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the front mic first. We, oui, uh, Daniel Gobey, the UPA. Daniel Gobey, UPA. It's really interesting uh, what you uh, do uh, within Ag Agriculture, Agri Food Canada, in coordinating with various partners. Now you've said it: agriculture uh, and farmers are at the front line of, to fight climate change. And what you also mentioned is that this is an opportunity to have value added for our sector. Now we see a lot of different steps with uh, carbon markets and all of these various steps could actually benefit our sector, our industry as a whole. Uh, there's uh, other sectors that would need to turn to us, uh, such as uh, uh, fuel and so on. So how can we benefit from all of these gains, gains for the sector as a whole? Well, we feel that uh, our consultations about the strategy have shown that this is the opportune time 
to uh, make these representations before the government. As you know, all of these projects are under the jurisdiction of the Environment Department, and they have an order of priority in carbon markets and in the pro protocols that they're developing based on demand and based on how far we've progressed in terms of data, measuring things, that's absolutely essential. And also in terms of the import relative importance of this protocol compared to other sectors. And I, what we have to put forward, and I'm looking to my colleagues within the room here, but for we've been dealing with this for several years and trying to see how we can raise the profile of the agricultural sector within the priorities of the environment ministry. And I think there we have an opportunity because we can give them this clarity uh, the minister, the Department of, Agri of the Environment is part of our advisory committee. They're there at the table, and so they are listening. And the Department of the Environment, they know that they will have to participate in the actions and solutions that accompany our strategy. So this really is a key time to sort of change the way our policies are set at the federal level so that we can better align with uh, this strategy. Thank you. We're going to keep a close eye on your consultations. Hi there. Tyler Fulton with Canadian Cattle Association. <clears throat> the last presentation I found uh, really wow. interesting um, in that I I haven't seen a lot of those independent farm um, emission um, uh, estimates um, to date. Um, so my question, I guess, is, uh, well, it's a comment and a question. Um, we can't manage what we don't measure. And I think a really key tool would be having access to the information for our specific operations, what our carbon footprint is. And then we can make informed decisions as to what the, what the way forward would be for, the, for our own independent farms. So my question is, to what degree is that going to uh, play a role, or what, to what degree will that be uh, uh, a service that's offered um, to help us with uh, more sustainability. Who would like to kick off, Sarah? Would you have any comments based on your work? <clears throat> oui, merci. Yes, thank you for that question. What you mentioned in your comment is exactly what we are hoping for. The, we've gathered independent knowledge here, and that is what allows us to share that knowledge and to develop a tool that will be accessible for farmers. The only nuance is that with the exercise that we've carried out, we've realized that in order to use uh, that, you need to have a, an advisor working with the farmer. That may be the best way to move forward, because you need some data. You need to have some information over the course of a full year about your production, about how uh, you feed your uh, animals, uh, the rations and so on, all of the inputs, all of the energy use. You need to put all of that together and to use it as part of a calculator. What we decided to do voluntarily is to develop a new calculator, because currently there really was nothing that was accessible for uh, this type of quick uh, knowledge, quick use for advisors and for farmers. We saw some of the HOLAS results, and it's interesting, but it's a tool that really was developed for research purposes, and it requires a whole lot of data. What we did was to try and find what is the most sensitive data to come up with a calculator that uses as little data as possible from the farm to get as precise a result as possible. And with these results, we can also try and figure out how to reduce. Because what's important to us is to better document each type of emission based on data, on farm data, but we also wanted to see how we can impact that, what kind of actions we can put together. So the important thing uh, is developing a platform, uh, and we've done that through uh, 
funding from AFC, and we want that to be available starting in 2025. So we want to make it operational by then. But it's been developed for Quebec, and I have to specify that because I was said earlier, and it's the case everywhere throughout the world, there's applied research in Quebec from AFC, from Laval University. It's very specific, it's very interesting, and we took that into account in our calculator. So in an ideal world, this type of calculator could uh, be duplicated, be used elsewhere in Canada. It is quite achievable. It's not super complex. It's doable, but it requires a lot of time within each province, putting together all of the knowledge and integrating that into the calculator, working with researchers. But it is doable. We've done it, and it, we keep improving it. There's more research all the time, and the whole idea here is to have a continuum of improvement over time. But we can have a look at these results for the cattle farm that we have in Quebec, and we can share this information with you as well. Okay, thank you. Are there other comments from the table? I would just encourage, you know, uh, to the point or the comment in Tyler's question as well. I think, you know, if these are, if you're hearing about tools that you think are really important to inform the sustainable agriculture strategy and its adoption, make sure that comes through in your submissions and input into the process moving forward as well. Devin, and then Stan. Hi, uh, thank you, Devin Walker with uh, APAS uh, in Saskatchewan. So I guess I have, I have two two questions and comments. One, I really liked the uh, infographic uh, uh, showing the percentage of reduction that we could achieve with, with certain modeling and forward. I really like that. A little bit to echo Tyler's comments there. Uh, it's really positive to see that forward thinking and, and what's tangible. And, and then I like that you pointed out the, the kind of the untangibles, the unknowns of certain adoptions. I like that. Uh, so on that question too, I wanted to ask about the mineralize, um, mineral fertilizer manufacturing. And I just wanted to ask uh, why that was included in the piece. As most producers, we don't have control over the manufacturing of the minerals or how they're produced. They're, they're sort of an on-the-shelf product for us to choose to consume or not. Um, but I did notice that the, that manufacturing component didn't change with the models or the size of farms. So I wanted to ask that question. And then uh, second comment or question, you said this, Sophie, the strategy rolled out kind of before the solutions or, or the strategy comes after the, the initial. Uh, so utilizing, if we're looking at regional areas or provincial areas, utilizing a certain uh, verification and uh, financial and practice delivery tools that are already existing, like uh, say SAS crop insurance or the provincial crop insurance desks to verify wet acres, treed acres, unfarmed acres. Uh, do you see that as being a possible solution once things are adopted and general farm public is doing these practices that that could be a verification vehicle? Like we, we have two wet to seed acres. Uh, we have green spaces that we can't farm, like maybe we have two green to seed spaces and it becomes a checkbox that I know, Scott, you mentioned to keep that separate, the two programs separate, but still go through the same administering vehicle. Do you see that as a, as a point moving forward? So there's just two questions for you both. Thank you very much. Who would like to start? Sarah, I think the first question was posed more in your direction, if you're comfortable taking the lead. We um, oui, don't. Yes, thank you for that question. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the fertilizer production. And yes, to answer that question, uh, it's part of the DIG protocol, and it was part of the recommendations of the advisory group. Uh, these are standards that apply in agriculture, so that's the way they're applied. But it's different when you talk about uh, Canadian or Quebec inventory, where you don't take into account importing products. When you do an on-farm uh, results, and you have to look at everything that comes into the farm and the impact of producing all of the elements, all of these inputs, so even the energy on top of being used on the farm, it's, there's also a footprint to producing that energy initially. So it's all standardized as part of IPCC. But to get back to I th okay, that's it. First question, I think it's, um, it's actually open for debate. I mean, um, you could say manu uh, fertilizer manufacturer has an impact on, on the farm's carbon footprint. That's unfair, no control over that. 
I think the SAS consultations is a perfect opportunity to have a big old debate about that. Do we want to maybe explore potential solutions that address fertilizer manufacturing specifically? Being careful, though, that if we go in too aggressively, there might have some consequences for producers in sort of, you know, <laughs> source of fertilizer, quantity, et cetera. So th this is the conversation that we want to have because it's never a simple conversation. If you go in and act and try to have an impact over here, it might have unintended consequences on, you know, on production and, and supply chains and availability. So we're, we're open for that difficult conversation, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, on the second part of the question, um, I think we're skipping ahead, perhaps. So if I, if I answer this question, I'm skipping ahead. And so I will refrain from doing so. Um, but I think that, again, it comes back to what, what do you all think? Are, would, you, would there be appetite to go there um, is, is the question. Uh, what would be it's like an opportune time frame maybe to get to that part of things? I think right now, in terms of SAS consultations and development of a strategy, we're just really trying to get to the, the front end, which is identifying the feasible practices to be adopted. How can we get more producers to adopt them? Where can we get the biggest bang for our buck? And how do we bridge the gap knowing that program and science and research dollars are finite and we still have a gap to sort of reaching certain targets or even curbing the, um, the curve of emissions, right? Just to get us to sort of like stop going up in terms of emissions, um, what do we do? How do we, how do we sort of um, coordinate our, 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 our actions to even just get to that? And that's, that's, our, that's our, our, our first question, essentially. Okay. And thank you. I know um, there's a lot of questions. We are running into time here. We do have to empty the room in about two minutes here uh, for the security sweep that's got to happen. So I think, Stan, we can give you the last question. I just encourage you to be very brief if you can. And, and just to remind everyone at the conclusion of this, please take whatever you need with you and leave the room following this session. And we'll be about 20 minutes before you can come back in to have lunch in here. But Stan, I'll give you the last question. And just note that you know many of the people on stage here will be around for a while. If you have questions, I certainly encourage you to uh, pull them aside in the hallway. So, Stan, please go ahead. Good. I'll, I'll try to keep it in a minute and a half now because we're probably there <laughs> right now. So, mostly more of some statements. So, just a couple things I want to just comment on. One is, Scott, you started off this conversation by sustainability called the triple bottom, uh, what did you call it, a triple bottom line or something? That was your focus? So I think when we look at everything we're talking about sustainability here, I think that's really critical that we look at those three key pillars. The other thing that I heard is um, under the strategic plan, the government didn't come with a strategic plan in mind. They were looking for collaboration. I look at this 2030 timeline and I'm concerned. There's a lot of things that need to happen in seven years. Donald uh, from PEI, you referred to the lack of carbon methodology. And um, we have nothing to measure that right now. So when I look at that, that really concerns me when we're looking forward and we're trying to build policy around what our um, carbon sequestration looks like and, and carbon mitigation strategies when we really don't have good methodology for measurement. And I think um, when it comes down to collaboration, I'd like to see a stardom saying, what is the measurement so we really know where we're at so we can actually form the right programs. And, and that's why I just want to say, I think we need to, I would say, slow down the train here a little bit. Farmers are every day busy with trying to get the job done, and it's like they're getting pounded with one new train after another coming at them. And I think we have to be careful here. So, so maybe I'll just take Chair's prerogative, because uh, sitting in on the advisory committee discussions, what you're conveying is not the first time we've heard that message, and I think the, the primacy of data is really important. We need to know where we're starting. We need to ensure we have the data to inform progress and just make sure that we're doing this in a fashion that is building on a strong evidentiary base. So I think like there's no question that data is at the forefront of this conversation. And I think we all understand the timelines look very aggressive and ambitious and there's concern there. And I think uh, all I'll say is I think you know, very important feedback and I encourage you to make that very clear in your submissions. But I think, uh, and Sophie could attest to this as well, it's not the first time that message has been heard. Uh, so in the interest of just moving things along, I think we'll have to conclude here. One other note I would just raise, please everyone take your interpretation headsets with you out of the room. We've been asked to remove all of the interpretation headsets. So, Oh, leave them. Okay. 
Sorry, Catherine, do you want to come up and send that message? So just one more second, uh, housekeeping. Th first, before we get there, thank you to the panel. I'm sorry for the rushed end here. It's a little unique, but thank you very much.